So thank you everyone for calling in. I know we're gonna have a few more, but I definitely wanna get started. Um, like I said in the page, um, Judy has known my mother, who's also on the call, for years, and she had told me about Judy a couple months ago and told me that we should connect, and because starting my own business, I obviously have a huge passion for helping others and being an entrepreneur, and Judy has been so successful um, with her business, and she has so many great tips for us, so I'm really excited to have her on the call and thankful that she's taken time out of her day in order to do this for us. Um, so welcome, Judy, and um, we're so excited. I have my notebook ready, so I'm going to be taking lots <laughs> of notes. So everyone, make sure you have a notebook or your computer out to take notes. Um, I will record the call as well, but I think it's always good to have handwritten notes that you can kind of look at every day. So, um, so take it away, Judy. Let me um, share it with you so then you can have ownership over it. Okay. Um, All right. Well, I'm the host. So now do I just give you put my PowerPoint up? Yeah, so if you just put up, pull up your PowerPoint and then share your screen, you should be good. I'll let you know if I can see it, but it should be all set. Can you see it? Not yet. Did you share your screen? Hang on. Let me go back out again. Should be a little green button. Green button. Oh, here it is. Got it. Okay, so share screen. Yep, we can see it. Awesome. Okay. Yay. Okay, so I have to have my glasses on because I can't read and talk at the same time. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so anyway, I'm really, really, really excited to be here. And like Heather said, Jody and I have known each other for at least two decades, at least. And we've been through lots of different changes in business because business has changed, but it's still the same. The basics are the same. It's the way we do business that makes it different. Oh, let me just, okay. So let's just tell, let me tell you quickly who I am because I think it's important for you to know my background just a little bit so you know who you're listening to and why. I am a self-proclaimed entrepreneur. I've only held a corporate position for two years and it was the longest two years of my entire life. You know, while I love doing the training and the coaching for everybody in the field, it was the corporate environment that wasn't right for me. And so it was a time for me to take a leap, but we're gonna talk about that in a moment. So throughout the most productive and profitable selling years, I had two fans that kept me going every single day, my children. You see, I was a single mom for 19 years and I worked in a position that was straight commission. Imagine that. And if I didn't work, I didn't sell. If I didn't sell, my children would be the ones that actually would suffer. So every time I had to pick up that phone and make calls, instead of thinking that it weighed a thousand pounds or that it was gonna strangle me, I decided to put a picture of my kids and their tuition bills right next to my phone. And there was nothing more motivating than that. So after being in construction and being in security systems and then insurance, I moved from Connecticut to North Carolina and I kept building my agency. And I was in uncharted territory because I'm not a Southern girl, but I kept going down South. I didn't know anybody, but I kept telling people what I did and I kept building relationships along the way. So my agents were productive, my agents were profitable, but the secret was out that they were selling and they were staying. So with that combination, I was asked to move to Dallas and help build a training department so that the entire country would actually be consistent in their training and would be able to provide a reason for people to stay. So in many sales positions, people are promised an opportunity and then once they say yes, they're often left to their own devices. And sometimes it's really scary for them because now they have to prospect, they have to network, they have to close and they have to support their clients. And with the training we built, all the steps were provided for the agents. Okay, so let's go back to that leap that I mentioned. I can't really see anybody's hands, but I'm going to ask you, did you ever decide to take a leap and build a business? I mean, we all have at one time or another, and all of you must have been because you're all in business now. So were you excited? Were you nervous? Were you scared? Because I know that I was really nervous about making that leap. And sometimes people don't even make the leap. 
So wouldn't it be wonderful if that's the kind of leap that we took? It was so graceful. It was so beautiful. It doesn't work like that. So let me tell you how it actually went. I handed in my resignation in March of 2009, except they wouldn't take it. They were, um, there was a lot of things going on, and I was a stable influence within the field. And they were afraid that if I did that, then more, there'd be some craziness in the field. So they asked me not to mention it to anyone, and they wouldn't let me go until they were ready to announce it. Seriously, I was trying to resign, and they were going to tell me when I could do that. But I'm a team player, so I decided. I love the field, I agree to it, and I didn't make any decisions that would hurt anybody. What I didn't do, what they didn't understand was that I had a date in mind that I was leaving no matter what. So if they didn't take my resignation by that date, I was going, it didn't matter. So it didn't matter if I was 100% ready, it didn't matter if I was, you know, if everything fell into place, it didn't matter if I had money, I was leaving. So here's what I did. I had a calendar, and you can see this is May of 2009, and I circled the date that I was leaving no matter what, and it was May 22nd. And so I called that my freedom day, because I knew at that date, if, if and if they weren't gonna take my resignation, I was leaving anyway, it didn't matter. So I wanted to be able to do what, whatever I wanted, with whomever I wanted, whenever I wanted, and that's what I did. But what I also did was, I got paid bi-weekly, so every time that they would give me a check or deposit money into my account, I would make a note on my um, register that said investment into my business. So my mindset wasn't that, oh, I can't believe I'm still here. It was more like, here I'm going and this is where I'm going to. So I didn't have to resent the business at all. So there I was in 2009 at the height of this amazing, fabulous economy and I was starting a new business but I was in a place that I didn't know anybody except the people in the company that I just resigned from. So it's not a great place to build a business, isn't it? So as a sales trainer, the first thing I told everybody, all my clients to do was to start learning how to prospect and network. And there I was at a networking event and I knew no one and I had no idea why I was even there. So I did what any professional mature woman would do. And I looked for the loneliest person in the room and I sat with him. We didn't even say hello. We just sat together. And after a few hours of just sitting there, I thought, okay, I networked, which was the stupidest thing I could have said because it was a ridiculous experience. It was a waste of my time. But I knew that I had to figure something out. So I started to go to all different events, all different networking events, different times of the day. Didn't matter. I set up one-on-ones with everybody. And what happened was it finally hit me that I was horrible at doing what I was teaching people to do. I was getting no business. I was not, nobody was really interested in what I was doing because I wasn't anywhere where my potential clients were. All I was doing, I was busy getting busy. So it was time to start all over again. And believe me, you want to quit on numerous occasions, but you don't realize how close you are to achieving what you really want to achieve. So what did I do? I sat myself down, I put on my big girl panties, and I said, why? Why am I doing this? Why am I in this situation? And what is it that I really want to do? And who do I want to do it with? And I was back to my Freedom Day thoughts again. So you have to understand that what makes a real difference is your why. And I realized I had a solid why, but I just wasn't saying it out loud. Because I realized that I was the only female in the businesses that I was in, or close to the only female. And I realized that I also didn't want to be one of the boys. I wanted to make sure that I had some balance because I wanted to be a loving mom, but I also wanted to be the top producer at the same time. And I knew there were women out there that were struggling to earn what they wanted and more importantly, deserved. So there was my why. But now I had to figure out who this woman was. And of course, you know, I can say that my business is just for women and I eliminate 50% of the population, but that's still too large a group. So I started narrowing it down and I decided on a niche. And why a niche? Because in business, we often think that the bigger the market you work with, the more profitable it's going to be. But that's not true. Because when I ask other entrepreneurs who your market is, who you're serving, they say everyone. Now, that's not possible because not everyone needs everything that you have. It doesn't matter how great your product is. The truth of the matter is size does matter. And experts have said the smaller the niche, the more profitable you are. So how does it really work? Because you have to really ask yourself, who actually needs your help? 
and who really wants to work with you. It's kind of like a double whammy because you have to want them and they have to need you. So there's nothing worse than realizing that they're really just not into you. So in my business, I thought I had it all figured out, but in my reality, my market was still too large. It was women, and I truthfully did eliminate 50% of the population, but it was still not streamlined enough. And all this time, I had this silly message playing in my head that I'm sure you all have experienced at one time or another. If I eliminate any group of people, then I'm eliminating a chance to work with people and help them. The truth of the matter is that you have to decide who you really want to work with because if you keep thinking that you can help everyone, you will help no one. You have to decide on what this person looks like. You have to say like, you can go down to as much as their age and their weight and their height and their eye color. But I think more about who they are, what they bring to the table. Where do you want to work with them? What's their challenge? So here's what my market looks like. It's female entrepreneurs. They have to be women that are in sales, who are passionate about their field, who deal largely with sales, who may feel undervalued or underappreciated, who aren't afraid of a little work to gain their success, and who are ready to invest in themselves. Now remember, I'm a for-profit company, not a non-profit, so I also needed to make sure I was in front of the people that could pay for what I was doing. Okay, so let's go back to networking again. Now that I had my perfect person identified, oops, sorry, I have to really figure out where I can find her. So my feet was like, how do I find this one person or this group of people that I've always wanted to work with? They were my target market. This was my sweet spot. Well, what I've always been told is when you write a book or build a business, you have to go with what you know. What's your skill set? You need to be able to identify, and I mean really identify who your target audience is, and then ask yourself three simple questions. What are the demographics? Where do they hang out online and offline? And what are their day-to-day -day concerns? Okay, so I was just speaking at a conference not too long ago, and a woman approached me, and she told me she had decided to, to, to join a direct sales company. And they had been in business for millions of years already. But so I asked her, who's your target audience? Because she had no idea how to get started. And I kept asking her questions, and she had no answers for me. And she had this blank look on her face. So I said to her, tell me about yourself. What, where do you come from? And she said she had just retired after 40 years of teaching. And I said, okay, are there anybody else? Are there any other teachers that are retiring? And she said, yes, there's a bunch of us. And I said, are they ready to retire and just retire? Or are they ready to retire and start something else? So she started saying that they're not ready. They're too young to retire from, you know, from the world. They're not ready to just sit there and sit on a rocking chair. So I said to her, are they also looking for residual income? And she said, I, I believe so. So now the bells are going off in my head, but still not hers yet. So I kept asking more and more questions. But all of a sudden, she looked at me and she said, my target market are teachers. And that's how that happened. So when you do that, you're doing things with intention. You have to network with intention. You can't do what I did and sit with somebody that you don't speak to or go every place and you think you're so popular because you're always busy. You have to find the places online and offline that your perfect person is hanging out. You have to put yourself in a situation where you're meeting people everywhere you go, but the right people. Because the chances of finding someone that raises their hand and says, pick me, pick me, is greater when you're surrounded by your target market. So we talk about niche marketing simply because it's a smaller market. This group of people have a specific need. So you wanna make sure that you understand how important a niche market is. Because number one, a smaller group of people are very specific and they have a unique need that you can actually cater to. The second, when people know exactly what you do and who you work with, you can get referrals because people know exactly what your specialty is. The third is, when you work with a specific market, you have the potential of finding a strategic partnership that can already help you because they're already in your market. Fourth, you have to be, when you're laser focused on your target, it takes away all the guesswork of where you need to be and how you find your people. And the most important is, you're positioning yourself as an expert because they're going to be Looking for you as an expert, it increases your credibility, and people prefer to work with somebody that they think is an expert. 
You might be asked to speak. You might be asked to write articles. So you become the expert in your market. So don't you think that all of you would rather be the health and wellness expert? Wouldn't you want your name to be linked to the wellness guru? And don't you think you'd attract more customers and great customers become great members of your team? So if you show people that you love your company and you love your products and they see how supportive you are, your success will shine through. And they know that you're in their corner and they remind you, you remind each other about the success. Now, I always talk about the success is from the bottom up, not the top down. So when you are actually helping somebody that's just starting out, you're going to succeed because you're helping them succeed. If you do it from the top down, it's only about you. And that's the worst thing you could do. So being an expert helps you stand out. It makes you unique. You want to make sure that people understand what your uniqueness is, what your brilliance is, and that you can help people find solutions and also share that with their friends and colleagues. And what happens with that is you start to get referrals. And I always call them the most expensive free leads that you can possibly find. When somebody offers you a referral, they trust you and they want to bring you into their circle. So how do you help them? Well, once you know who your market is and what they look like and where they hang out, what they need, you're ready to make things happen. And your goal truly is, is to be aiming your target. Just take that bow and arrow and right hear it, just right into the bullseye. Because when that direct aim happens, your market is qualifying themselves or disqualifying themselves just by you asking questions. If you came to a group of people that you thought was your target market and you started having a conversation and you asked them, but, you know, is what's your goal? And everybody said, I want to get fat. They're not your target. But if everybody said to you, I want to be well, and I want you to help me, here's my hand. I'm raising myself up. Help me out. So one of the things that's extremely important to know when you're attending networking events is you have to be ready. And you have to be there not to sell people. You have to be there. You have to be there to actually um, network and build a relationship. You don't want to offer somebody your product. You don't want to offer somebody something that is a real hard sell because that's not what networking is for. I mean, if think about it. Have you ever gone to a networking event and a realtor comes up to you and says, hey, you want to sell your house? That's like the last thing you're thinking about. Well, why should somebody want to buy a product from you or why should they want to um, you know, start a business with you if they don't even know you? So I'm going to give you a couple of my secrets for networking that when you network with your target audience, this has helped me tremendously. And I guarantee you, I've never sat and not talked to somebody again because of some of the things that I've learned and some of the things I made up for myself. So the first thing is you want to arrive early. When you come in first, everybody walks up to you. You don't have to walk up to anybody and say, hi, what's your name? Hi, my name is Judy. When you're there first, they walk up to you. It's a much more relaxed conversation. Second, you want to have a goal in mind. You shouldn't be networking just to collect business cards. You have to have a goal in mind. My goal is always to meet three people, three people that I want to have a relationship with, just three, not 12, not two, just three. Because the deal for me is three is easy to work with, okay? So when I find those three people, I will go up to them and I will say, Heather, I want you to meet three amazing women today and you're one of them. That conversation, the dynamics of that has changed drastically because now you realize, I think you're amazing, and now you want to know why I think you're amazing, okay? The next thing is, you have to bring business cards. I know it sounds really stupid, but there's so many people that don't even bring business cards to a networking event. And especially if this is your target audience, you want to make sure they have a way to connect with you. But here's the other thing. When somebody hands you a business card and they're really somebody you can't wait to get in front of again, take the corner and fold down the edge. So when you take it out of your pocket, you remember this is somebody that's really important. Um, I had talked to a university and there were 250 young students that were graduating in the road to marketing. And I told them about bending their, you know, folding down the corner. I got 250 business cards with folded down as edges because they heard what I said and they wanted to make sure I knew how important they were. You know, you have to know the top three. The top three in any networking event is the person that is the facilitator that organized it, the person at the registration desk, and the speaker. Between the three of them, they know everybody. So you want to make sure that you know those three people. Also, don't huddle with people that you know, because this is called hanging out, and that's not what people want to do. They're not going to go and, and you know, barge into a group that's already you know, very well connected. 
You have to go up to talk to people that you don't know. I mean, that's all part of networking, not my favorite thing. Like I said before, don't hard sell your company, just you wanna build a relationship. Ask lots of questions so people know that you're interested in them and not that you're just interesting. Don't just go to women's associations. You need to go to all kinds of networking events where your target audience is and follow up. Let me just say that follow up is just as important in networking as it is in sales or anything else. If you promise somebody that you're gonna do something, you can send them information by that night. If you don't, why would they do business with you? If you can't do something as simple as following up, they're not gonna do business. So the second part of it is the strategic partners. Now let me just say that this is as important, if not more, than your target audience. Because a strategic partner is really people that are in your space already, collecting money from your audience, and they compliment you, not compete with you. So maybe, for instance, you might have as a strategic partner somebody that owns a um, sporting goods store, you know, for beautiful clothing that you use for working out. Or maybe it's somebody that owns a health food store and they give you a percentage of, you know, clients because you're bringing them in. I have somebody that is a wellness coach. She doesn't do um, products or anything. She really is more like a weight loss coach. And what she does is she uh, is a strategic partner with a very large, uh, like a Whole Foods kind of store, but not Whole Foods. And what she does is she brings her clients in and she does shopping with them in the store. So what the store does for her is they give her a conference room to do her meetings. They give her a percentage off all of her shopping plus her clients. And they give her access to almost anything that she needs because it's very strategic for them. She has given them new clients that they may not have had. So strategic partners are awesome. If you think about it, like a realtor, a strategic partner for them would be a mortgage company, title company, um, uh, movers, storage units, because these people are already in your space. So think about it like that. It's very strategic and it's very intentional. And like I said, follow-up is key. You have to do follow-up because the next slide that I'm gonna show you will tell you some statistics that are really scary about people that don't follow up, okay? So uh, just look at these and think, I hope I'm not in those statistics. So the first one it says is 48% of salespeople never follow up with a prospect, never. Okay, 25% will make a second contact, 12% make a third, 10% makes more than three. Now, here's the other side of it. Only 2% of sales are made on the first contact. 3% on the third, 10% on the fourth, and 80% anywhere from fifth to twelfth. I mean, this is huge. And if you want a copy of this, I will gladly send this to you. It has no, you know, no problem. But what I'm saying to you is, if you do not follow up, look what you can lose. This is, this is amazing. So let's go into the next piece. Now, I want to say that sometimes I do goal setting first and prospecting and networking second. Sometimes I reverse it. It really depends on what you're comfortable with. But when you start to see how easy this looks, if you, you know, it is when you start to do it correctly, it doesn't matter which comes first. So you've identified your target, you're, you're networking, you're building relationships, and hit, now you're going to do some goal setting. So here's the deal with goal setting. Let me give you some statistics. Only 12% of goals are achieved. Only 12%. And why is that? Because we don't achieve the goals because we can't get ourselves motivated or because they're really not something we want to meet in the first place. So when you're setting your goals, you have to really decide what it is that you want to achieve in your life. You have to make sure that it isn't just a distraction. It isn't irrelevant. It has to be something that motivates you and it has to help you build your self-confidence. Because goals can give you the experience that you want in life. Instead of just letting life happen to you, goals will let life happen. So uh, athletes have goals. Um, successful people, uh, business people have goals. Everybody has short-term, long-term goals. But it helps you to focus. And that's what you need, especially in a business where you are sometimes by yourself. And it's also something that may not be easy for you. So if you start to set goals, it's much, much easier. So the very first thing you have to know about goal setting is you have to write them down. You have to write your goals down and you have to put them in detail. Now, I know that most people do SMART goals and I'm gonna do that in a minute, but I wanna show you a different way of looking at them and it's called the six P's of goals, goal setting. And it's, they're just a little bit different, but we'll go to SMART in a minute. 
But research tells me or tells everybody that when you write down your goals, they're more likely to be achieved than not writing them down because you can review them, you can review them often. And I always tell people, make sure that you have your goals someplace that you can look at them and review them on a regular basis. So the first P is positive. You wanna state your goals in a positive rather than a negative term. So instead of saying um, that I'm no longer, that I'm neat and organized, you wanna say that instead of saying I'm no longer disorganized. So make it on a positive note. The second is, it has to be in the present tense. You have to say it as if it's happening right now. I am, I have, not I will or I might. You know, so if you're, you're saying that you, I have 12 new coaches, not I might, I have. You put it in the present tense. The third one is personal. The goals have to be about you and something that's under your control, not about somebody else. Somebody can't tell you that you have to do this or do that. These are your personal goals. The next one is precise. You have to write a goal in a manner that is clear what you're going to do with it. You can't say that I'm going to lose weight. You're going to say that I have lost this. And I don't even say lost weight. You want to just release it. Because if you lose it, you can find it. So you release it. You have to make them possible. The goals have to be realistic. And you have to be something that they can achieve. And the last one is powerful. You want to use words that convey emotion and action. So those are the six P's, positive, present tense, personal, precise, possible, and powerful. So you want to make sure that, I mean, I have my goals you know, on my computer. I have them in my, uh, my, my bag. I always see what my goals are. If you review them and you're way ahead, that's kudos to you. If you review them and you're behind, you have to speed it up a little bit. And sometimes you do have to adjust your goals because life does happen. So let's go to SMART. And we all know about SMART. So obviously the S is specific. You want to make sure that you define your goal as much as possible. Who's involved? What do I want to accomplish? Why am I even doing this? So be as clear and detailed as you can. The M is for measurable. How do you track your progress? Can you measure your outcome? How do you know when you reach your goal? When I started in my company, I didn't write any kind of goals down because I thought it's just me, I know what I wanna do. But how do I measure I know what I wanna do? It doesn't make sense. My son asked me one year, he says, what's your goal this year? And I said, to earn more money I did, than I did last year. He said, oh, okay, so if you earn a dollar, you earned more. Does that make sense to you? So there's you know, the child becoming the parent. The A is attainable or achievable. Is it a reasonable goal to reach or is it so far-fetched that you are already throwing up your hands and saying, I can't do this? On the flip side, if it's way too easy, it doesn't require any effort. Is that good as well? No. The R is relevant. Is your goal consistent with your other goals? You know, you, you don't want to have something that doesn't make sense, that doesn't work either now or long term for you. So you want to make sure that it's relevant for where you are right now. And the T is time bound because when will you complete it by? Does it create a sense of urgency for you? And will you be able to manage your time in order to do this? So SMART goals, uh, six P's, however you want to do it. But here's what I want to tell you. You need to share your goals with someone or lots of someone's because you want to let people know what you're doing and people become your accountability partners. The worst thing you could do is keep your goals to yourself. You don't reach them and then you go, well, you know, I, I couldn't do it anyway. But when you tell somebody what your goals are, you have people that support you. When I was writing my second book, I told my, my mastermind group that I was going to have my book ready for the printer by February 1st. I will tell you that my accountability partners kept calling me every week, where are you? You're going to be there for February 1st. And February 1st, my book was at the printer. The other thing about goals is um, when you reach a milestone, you have to take time to celebrate. Don't just let it go and say, oh, that was good enough. What's next? You have to celebrate the small stuff or you're not going to want to continue for the big stuff. Okay, so how do you eat an elephant? And I always say it's one bite at a time. But let's talk about goal setting because the elephant is a giant goal for you. When we create goals for ourselves, a lot of times they're so overwhelming and they're so daunting. And the truth of the matter is, if you picture your goal as this giant elephant, you're probably setting yourself up for failure. However, if you look at each bite as a milestone that you reach before you tackle that entire elephant, your mindset will change. So think about the goals that you might have. That's your elephant. 
and let's break it down and work together to reach it because we're going to work backwards and make it more manageable one bite at a time. So when you break your goals down, it's much easier to swallow. So let's pretend that you need 24 coaches to get to the next level of your business over the next year. That's a lot of coaches if you really think about it and a lot of people that you need to talk to. So what if you took that 24 and you divided it by 12 because there's 12 months in the year. That means you need two every single month. But each month also has four weeks in it. So that means that you really need half a person every week. And if you divided it by five because you work five days like anybody else does, well then really you just need a body part every day in order to make up a coach. So it's a lot easier to think of it that way, that you only need this little bit every single month as opposed to 24 coaches. So let's say you coach, let's say your goal was $120,000 a year, okay? That means that every month you need $10,000. Every week you need $2,500. And every day you need $500. So what can you do every single day to deposit $500 into your bank account? What is it? Because, it, you know, it depends on whether you're looking at customers, are you looking at coaches? Whatever it is, don't make the goal, the goal so big that you can't do it, but what can you do that gives you $500 every day? You want to deposit into your account every single day. Now, some people are just looking to make a car payment, or maybe they want to pay their mortgage, and that's it. Guess what? The, sim the system is exactly the same. You divide it by 12, you divide it by 4, you divide it by 5. You start with the largest number, and you work your way down to the smallest. It's always easier to work with a smaller number than it is for the larger ones. Okay, the last piece I want to talk about, and is my absolute favorite, is time management. Because I know that this is truly the biggest challenge for most women. So how do you create that perfect balance between work and, and, business, and uh, life? The truth of the matter is there is no perfect balance, and I want you to understand that. To say that you're going to work 50% in your business and 50% at home does not work because if something happened to anybody in your family, what are you going to say? Okay, wait, I don't have uh, any time to give it because I already gave my 50%. That doesn't work. And what if you had a huge uh, project that you had to do or you want a trip? Well, can you take 50% away from your family? It doesn't work like that. What you have to make sure you understand is that the balance is what you give it. The balance is how you can... Divide your time, it doesn't have to be equally, among everything that you want to do. So when you're at work, you're present at work, and when you're home, you're present there. That's how you create balance. Now, I know that a majority of people, especially with direct sales, they work from home, and that's also a very tricky situation. So first, let me just say, I had an agent who worked from home. He was a single dad. He had two little girls. But his little girls wanted to play with daddy all the time. So imagine being on the phone, trying to make a sales call for insurance, and all you hear is, daddy, 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 daddy. That does not work, and it's very unprofessional. And even though a client might also have a little girl, and they think it's funny, it's also, it doesn't work. So what we came up with was a baseball hat. When he wore the baseball hat, his little girls knew that he was working. When that hat came off, it was daddy time. So it was something simple like that. So maybe you can come up with something that lets your family know what it is that when you're working or not. The other one, and this is my all-time favorite, is my calendar. I have been doing this for 30 years, and I still do it. So if you are a tech geek, take that out of your brain right now. You need to go out and buy yourself a blotter-sized calendar, okay? Something in Office Max or Staples or someplace like that. And you get different color markers. And then what you do is every person in your family gets a different color. So whatever you have to do, like if you have to take the kids to the orthodontist or you have to do volunteer work or you have a meeting you have to go to or you have a doctor's visit, that goes down as the have to's. But when you have everything on the calendar for everybody in your family, you can actually see when you can work and when you can't work. So for me, my kids both went to private school, so I had to volunteer, and, they, and I had to do things in the school, and they also had sports and everything else. So when I got everything out on the calendar, I knew that on Tuesdays there was no way I could be on the road because everything started at 8 o'clock in the morning, and I didn't finish till 6 o'clock in the day, and I only had an hour or two. So that was a good day to make phone calls. But on Wednesday, I had a five-hour block. That's when my appointments were. 
And that's how I work my calendar all the time. The other thing is that, you know, because my son was a uh, Division I soccer player, he was also on travel soccer. And if anybody knows what that means, it means we're all over the place all the time. I never, ever, ever, ever miss a soccer game because it was on my calendar. The other part of that is that your family gets to see that you are working and they become part of the whole experience because they realize that they are important enough to be on your calendar. And that always you know, made it very easy. My kids would realize that, wow, I'm really cool. I get it to be on my mom's calendar. So I just want to let you know what skirt is about. I know a lot of people think that selling in a skirt is about the article of clothing, but it really isn't. It's an acronym. And everybody has at least one of these challenges. So the S is for standing out, like we talked about. How do you show your uniqueness? How do you stand out from a crowd? We live in a very noisy world. So what makes you stand out? The K is for keys to success. What is it that you do that will help you propel yourself to the level of success that you want? And there's all different ways to do that. The I is for inspiration. What inspires you and how do you inspire others? What are your goals? What are your core values? Are they in alignment? The R obviously is for results. You know, what are the results that you're looking for? And the T, like I said, my favorite is time management. So that's really what the skirt stands for. Now, I want to give you a great resource also. This is free that you can sign up for. And what it does is it gives you access to articles and links to almost every single kind of industry you can think of. Direct sales is in there. Entrepreneurship is in there. Finance is in there. And it's the reportforwomen.com. What happens is when you subscribe to this, it's free. Okay, so don't think there's any, there's no hidden agenda here. When you subscribe to it, keep it in your favorite places because what'll happen is it'll automatically update on a regular basis and you'll see different articles coming out. So let's go back to the following up for a minute. When, you know, when we said that, you know, between five and 12 times touch points it takes to actually get somebody to do business with you. You can't keep asking somebody for selling, you know, for, to, buy, to buy something from you or be a coach. You can't keep doing that. You have to stop that. But what you can do in the middle is you find an article that reminds you of that person. You send them the link and you say, I saw this article. It made me think of you. Have a great day. That's it. Don't say, when are we going to talk? Don't say you're interested. Don't say anything else. Because what you're doing is you're touching them without selling to them. And then they can say, wow, you know, oh, Jody had this great article. I can't believe she remembered what I said. So, you know, I have an, a, a client who likes to travel and she likes to cook. I found an article about, you know, American Airlines had this cooking class through uh, Italy. So I sent her a copy of it. And she loved it. So it's things like that. Now, the other thing is, I want to just say that we all need help. So don't be shy about asking for help. You know, you've got a great coach in Heather. She's, she, I mean, I see her online all the time. And all she wants to do is help you. So it doesn't mean that you're weak. It means that you're wise. Ask somebody that has more experience than you for some help. But one of the things I do want to tell you is stop selling. Just have conversations with people. When you sell, 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 they'll see you coming, they'll give you the mark and they'll go, oh my God, here she comes again. And you don't want that. Direct sales has enough of a negative connotation because of that's the way it's always been and it's changed. But unless you let people know how it's changed and that you're not that kind of person, that every time you see them, you're going to take out the whiteboard and show them what the commission is, it doesn't work like that. So stop selling and ask people for help. Share your knowledge with people. Mentor people coming into the business. If you already know how to make this, these things happen, share your knowledge. So if you have questions, I'm sure we can. We have plenty of time for questions, and I'll be more than happy to answer them. And I want to give you, here's how you can find me online, and I have so much information that I can send to you and give you and everything else. I'm going to turn it back to you, Heather. Thank you so much, Judy. That was amazing. Um, I really appreciate it, honestly. Like, so much good information. I know you have so much more to give, to, um, And even my coaches that haven't weren't on, I mean, if, if that's okay with you, I'll definitely share the recording with yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Does anyone want to unmute themselves? Does anyone have any questions on what Judy went over? Um, I know it's a little bit of information to take in at once, but – um, if you guys have any questions on anything or if you want like a little more elaboration on something, please don't be shy and speak up. This is your opportunity. Absolutely.
for kids. <laughs> Hi, Judy. My name is Lindsay. How are you? Good. How, how are you, Lindsay? I'm good. So when you were talking about finding your target audience, basically, and where you fit into it, and that kind of struck a chord with me. So I, if you want to talk about that a little bit more, that would be amazing. I'm all ears because it's something I'm struggling with right now. Because um, I know, as you said, I want to help everyone, and it makes me nervous to cut people out. But at the same time, I get the benefits of, of finding your niche. Well, the problem is when you want to help everybody, that's a, that's a real female thing. You don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. You don't want to leave anybody out. But it's really nonsense. And you have to just get over yourself because it doesn't make any sense. So what I would say to you is, you know, think about who you want to spend time with. What's your background, Lindsay? In the past, I was an online marketer, and then I became a stay-at-home mom, and I have 16-month-old twins and a five-year-old. So I'm in the, the mom world right now. <laughs> okay. So maybe your market are moms. Maybe you're, you, know, you have to decide like, who you want to hang out with, because make your niche small enough that there's a need there, but not so small that it's more. But I would try to find out like, who, who it is that you want to do business with all that you want to hang with them all the time and what you need to do is you need to find out like where they are so maybe you know maybe it's as simple as going to uh, a PTO meeting or PTA meeting whatever they call it in your area and maybe it's going to the park and meeting moms there or maybe it's going to a fitness class where they have babysitting you know it could be anything like that something that you can go to on a regular basis and meet people and just you know don't talk about each body, you talk about relationships, you talk about their kids, they talk about your kids. You know, there was a study done between men and women, and they were both, all, the only instructions they were given was to sit at a round table, the men over here, the women over there. That was it. After 30 minutes, the men were able to talk about the sports teams, the promotions that they got, and the cars that they drove. The women already knew what the anniversaries, the birthdays were, how many kids you had, what was wrong with your husband, you know, all this kind of stuff because women build relationships. And that's the goal. When you can talk to somebody and have a real relationship with them and then, you, you know, they say, well, what do you do? You know, you look like you're so happy. You're home with your kids, blah, 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 blah. That's when you tell them. But I would definitely be looking for something that makes you unique in the market space. You know, if you did online marketing, you know, th there's a real need for that. There's a huge need for that. And you've got the expertise. The other thing I would tell you is um, either, you know, I know it's hard with kids to speak somewhere, but you can start writing articles. You can be a guest blogger. Start getting your name out there in the, in the segments that you want to be in. There's plenty of mommy bloggers out there that you can, they always look for guest bloggers all the time. And, and, you know, you don't get paid for it, but your name is out there. So Google, you know, like mommy bloggers or Google whatever your target is and say, I'd like to be a guest blogger. That's I know. I really appreciate you saying that. It's been rolling around in the back of my head to create webinars, um, starting with Facebook like pages, because not just for, you know, beach body coaches, but in general, anyone who wants to, you know, create more visibility with their brand and what business they're doing. So hearing you say that, I, I just it encourages me to go in the direction that's been swimming around in my head. So thank you. <laughs> then just do it. Okay. So on your calendar that, you know, today is Monday by Friday, you should have a page set up. Yeah. Okay. Cause it doesn't take anything to do the page. Then it's the promotion. And that's where your strategic partners come in because you start asking people, can you push this out? Can you, you know, get people to like it? Can you get people to join? That's what you do. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. That was great. Thank you, Judy. And You're I just, welcome. I just wanted to it'd be. Um, I just wanted to say something too to the coaches that are on the call and the ones that listen to it. When you were going through the whole networking part of the thing, I want people to understand how that relates to our business because we're not necessarily always going to networking events. Um, right. To be honest, I do think that's something that people should still do in this business. I think any opportunity you have to talk to someone in person, you should absolutely take and always have a business card with you for that reason. Um, because like you said, like you want someone to be able to remember you, you want them to be able to contact you if they want to, to continue to develop that relationship. Um, and I want you to guys to understand the tips that she went over still applies to what we do with building the relationships and, you know, putting yourself out there and branding yourself and 
you know, showing that you're an expert and people wanting to work with you in that way because it's so huge. And that's why we talk about like branding ourselves on Facebook and showing your passion for what you're doing because if people think you're wishy-washy about this and like you don't really even know what you're doing, like they're not going to want to come on your team. Like I ask myself this all the time and I have to remind myself that, you know, I must be doing a good job doing this because I have several coaches that are from my high school doing this, but people reach out to me and I strongly believe it's for that reason. It's because I've branded myself enough. I'm invested. I'm owning it. I'm showing them that this is something that I'm passionate about and I want to help others do it as well. So, you know, I need, I think everyone needs to get to that point in their business where if they definitely want to be doing this and their why is strong and they can connect with that, then put it out there, like put it out there for the world to see it and to get inspired by it. Um, because like Judy was saying, like that will bring business to you and it shows, you know, your personality and that this is something that you're really passionate about and want to be doing. Right. And you have to remember that even though this is direct sales, there, it's no different than doing sales for another company. And all the salespeople are at every networking event. Every single, every single networking event has salespeople in it, but it's all different industries. So what's the difference if you're doing direct sales? I mean, if, okay, first of all, when you go to a networking event, if every single person is, you know, Mary Kay and unique and all of these things, you start to think, oh my God, it's all direct sales. But direct salespeople, sometimes, many times, in many companies. So a lot of times you can find new coaches who are doing something else with another direct sales company. Somebody that's selling energy is not selling health and wellness. And they, they love the whole idea of direct sales. And if they don't want to do it, they know people that do. I know people that would rather do health and wellness than they would do makeup. And I know people that do makeup that would rather be doing energy. So, it, you know, I mean, they're all part of your market. But when you get to meet somebody face to face, it's a lot different than when you're doing things online because they can see you. They can see how successful you are or they can, they can see, you know, your presence because that's what people look for. They look for people that are successful. There's a lot of people that are in direct sales that you would never believe would be in direct sales. You know, CEOs of companies because they know what the compensation is. And by the way, the byproduct is that they'll get healthy and they'll be in shape. Absolutely. Um, does anyone else have any questions or want to add anything or say anything to Judy while we still have her? I know that eating the elephant is one of my favorite parts too. I think that's really important. I mean, I know Judy, we talked about goal setting and, um, Judy inspired me and it's been something I've been thinking about doing. So I'm going to do it this week um, with sharing my goals on the page and putting it out there guys and like creating that accountability for all of us as a team. I mean, this is super important. I know it's scary. I mean, it's even scary for me as a leader to put my goals out there. So all of you can keep me accountable, but like, this is something that's so powerful in our businesses, which I'm realizing and she's bringing to light for me. So, you know, most likely tomorrow I'm going to be sharing my goals. I mean, my, lengthy goals and breaking it out and, you know, breaking it down, like she was saying by week, by day on what I need to be doing to get to that long-term goal that I'm setting for myself for the end of the year. And, you know, it's February, we still have, you know, 11 months in order to achieve what we want to achieve. And you guys really need to be thinking about it in the way that she explained it was setting big goals, but then selling, setting smaller goals in order to achieve those. Cause I think that's where a lot of people get lost where they set this big goal and then they get so overwhelmed. They don't know what they need to be doing to get there. Then they don't reach the goal and then they get depressed because they weren't able to achieve it. Um, so think about that and think about, you know, the statistics she gave on, you know, people actually achieving goals. And that's something that I want to add too, is it's okay to not reach a goal. I mean, you should be setting goals for yourself and it's very unlikely to reach all of them, but if you don't set any goal, you're not going to accomplish much. So that's the reason we set goals is in order to continue to push our, move our businesses forward. And, you know, you have to keep reevaluating that. Like Judy said, you know, sometimes you'll hit your goals way quicker than you even expected to, which is fantastic. Sometimes you won't hit them and it's just an opportunity to learn and grow to, and continue to push forward. It's not an opportunity to just stop and, you know, you can feel sorry for yourself for a little bit, but then get back on and like, you know, make me right. keep pushing towards your, you know, your why. 
you know, there's a lot of people that they start their goals, you know, it's their New Year's resolutions. And the, the number one goal is always about weight loss. Always, always, always. And so people will say, you know, I want to lose 50 pounds this year. And after the first week, they're thinking, oh, my God, that's 50 pounds. I can't do this. But if you really think about it, it's a pound a week. So isn't it easier to say I want to lose a pound a week than saying I want to lose 50 pounds? So that's what you have to do. You have to take these giant goals and just make them small enough that you feel comfortable because if you're overwhelmed, you're going to be done before you even start. You're going to throw your hands up and say, okay, I, I can't do this. Absolutely. And the last thing I want to say that was really huge for me, um, cause this is something that I haven't done. You know, we talked a lot about this month, especially cause it's team cop. I'm working with my team in order to have a huge list of people that they're running through that they're willing to talk to and reach out to. So my list right now is at like 250 people. But now what I'm going to do is like attach my why to that list. Like she was saying, like every day wanting to pick up the phone is draining. No one wants to do it. You make excuses for it. You push it off. But if you have your why right next to that, if you have a picture, your why is your children sitting next to the phone. That is going to motivate you and inspire you beyond anything in order to do that. Like when you said that, like mind blowing for me, like huge, like I'm going to have that. Like maybe it's your entire dream board. I know a few of us just at the leadership retreat that I threw, we made dream boards. I mean, that should be your why. Like those things that have, you have a burning passion for that maybe make you want to cry because you know, you want to achieve them so much for you and your family. Like these are, this is what you need to be looking at every day in order to get you to that next level, in order to reach out to those people, in order to start building those relationships, in order to grow your network. Um, I just thought that was so powerful, Judy. And I love that you said it because it's really amazing. And it's definitely something that I'm going to implement for sure. And the other thing is take your goals and put them into some place that, that you get to see them. So you can review them on a regular basis. I am telling you that changed a lot for me because when I didn't, have, first of all, I didn't have goals to begin with. I just knew it. I knew everything because, you know, I even wrote a book about being an entrepreneur and how many mistakes I made. I even made up mistakes. That's how many I made. But when I started to you know, write down my goals and I had a place to review them, then I thought, oh, okay, so I'm behind this week. Okay, next week I'm ahead. But even if you reach your goals for the week and you exceed them, it doesn't mean the next week you do less. It just means that that week was a good week. No matter what, there's always going to be a bad week. It doesn't matter. So just keep going. You have to keep going. You never know how close you are to your goals until you actually review them. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Ooh. Uh, well, thank you so much, Judy. Again, I really appreciate this. This is amazing. Guys, definitely, you know, get one of her books if you're inspired to do that. Um, you know, look at her website. Um, I'm sure she'd be willing to have any of you reach out to her with any more questions. Absolutely. Um, definitely utilize the resources she has. And, you know, I know I'm going to continue to work with her as a mentor and I inspire all of you guys to reach out if you want to, because she's a fantastic woman and resource. So, um, thank you. Thank you again. And thank you everyone for, everyone for calling in. I love you guys. Thank you, Judy. It was awesome. Thank you. Love you too. Bye. Thank you so much, Judy. You're very welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. You're the best. Feel better, Jody. Thank you, honey. Talk to you soon. Okay, sweetie. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.